uh, Blanca Rodriguez Lopez is Associate Professor of Moral and Political Philosophy at the University Complutense from Madrid. At the beginning of her career, she worked on utilitarianism, rational choice theory and game theory. Later on, she worked on liberalism and social norms. And in the last few years, she has focused on bioethics and human enhancement. Her work is currently focused on moral enhancement and its relation with cognitive and mood enhancement. She also works on experimental ethics. Thank you to, to Michaela for inviting me to this online talk, to give this online talk, and to, to everybody who is attending. And, and I'm very glad because as, Mikhail, as Michaela said, I, I've been in Clues a couple of times. I love Clues and I should be there now. <laughs> But it has been impossible due to the present unfortunate circumstances. Okay. Can you see it? Fine. Okay. The, the title of my presentation is This Cognitive Enhancement and Competition and Experimental Study. Uh, after proposing this talk, I realized that it's a bit ambitious because um, I don't know you. I, I don't know what kind of background you have on enhancement or on experimental ethics. So, so at the end, I have decided to organize my talk this way. Hmm? Uh, in the first place, I'm going to say some words about human enhancement and some words about experiments in, in philosophy in general and in ethics in particular, just to make sure that we are all on the same page. And at the end, I'm going to present our work, and I, and I say it's our work because it's not mine alone. Uh, I will tell you about my colleagues later on cognitive enhancement and, and show you a, a small part of what we are doing. Hmm? So let's begin. This is a nice definition of enhancement. Hmm? There's a use of medicine, technology, and techniques to improve the capacities of people beyond what we, what we could consider normal or healthy. Why so many colors? Not because I am a colorful woman, because I'm not, but because I want you to, to realize that there are three different quite different things in this definition. Hmm? There are the means we are using, medicine, technology, and all the rest. There is a goal, hmm? the thing that you want to get through these means, that is to improve the capacities of people, and what I have called the benchmark. Hmm? How is this that we are calling an enhancement compared with other things? Hmm? The thing with which we are comparing our interventions is normal or healthy uh, state of a human being, whatever this may mean. Hmm? So let's uh, talk a bit about the goal. The general goal is to improve <clears throat> people's capacities. What kind of capacities? Every kind. Hmm? You have in, the, in your screen many of them. As you can see, some of them, let me go to my other screen, some of them are physical, hmm? uh, to be stronger or to be faster. Some of the physical things are related with health, like being healthier or live longer. Other things are what we can call cosmetics, hmm? well, to, to be more beautiful or to be thinner or whatever. 
Some others that are going to be especially important for us today are cognitive, hmm? to become smarter or to have more memory or more capacity of attention. Other are what we can call, well, are called in the literature moral, hmm? moral, uh, moral goals to get nicer, to get more empathy or to be in a better mood or to be more cooperative. So the, the, the goal of enhancement can be classified in, in quite different spheres of human capacities or yeah, capacities or, or in, in, in our own body. So why is important the means? Because as you can easily see, all these goals, first of all, are not new at all. This is what humankind has been trying since we were hunter-gatherers to get faster, to get stronger, to get healthier, to be nicer. And all this can be achieved through very different means. Mm -hmm. Again, you, you have here a not exhaustive list of means that we can use to enhance ourselves from training techniques, if you want to, to get stronger, to uh, organ transplant, if you want to live longer, you have many means. So, what is important about this list that you have here is that usually in the literature, they are classified in either environmental means or biological means. Um, we don't have a lot of time today to, to think about this, but the, it's, I think it's easy to realize that this uh, clear-cut classification, environmental, biological, doesn't work very well. Mm? Because some of the things are clearly environmental. For instance, living in a healthy and peaceful neighborhood. Mm? This is clearly about the environment. If you want your child to be healthier and smarter and more cooperative and all these things, one of the best things you, you can do is to move for a, to, to a healthy and peaceful neighborhood. This is clearly environmental. Other things are clearly uh, biological, organ transplant drugs, hmm? but other ones are not so clear. For instance, yoga or meditation. Is this biological or is it environmental or if you makeup? Makeup is usually classified as something that doesn't affect your biology. Hmm? Your, your body, simply because you can't remove it hmm, every night. But what about tattoos? This environmental is biological. So uh, I, I'm mentioning this because of the, but well, we are going to see why. This is just a list of uh, biological enhancements. Why? Because, uh, mm, no one, to the best of my knowledge, has any problem with environmental enhancements. All the philosophical and ethical problems uh, are about biological enhancements, even if we are not very sure, which is exactly bio uh, biological and not environmental. So, think in, in what in the literature we call biological enhancements that, as you can see, can be found almost in every realm. You have cosmetic biological enhancement, you have in the 
when we talk about sports, sports, you have many, anabolics, people, when you play music, even at the sexual level, Viagra is an enhancer. Hmm? There are some enhancements specifically for mood, for our cognitive uh, capacities. So we are going to think in, in, in this kind of, of enhancements. And then the last part of my definition uh, tries to establish exactly when I take a drug, for instance, that is clearly taken as a biological enhancement. And when this pill that I take, this drug that I take, think for instance in, in growth hormone, when is this properly enhancement? And when it's just treatment? Okay. Um, these are the, the standard definition of therapy. We talk about therapy, when we fix something that has gone wrong by curing specific diseases or injuries. So with this benchmark, everything, let's say, above this level is considered an enhancement. I have to, to say uh, that I'm very unhappy with this distinction. Many people are unhappy with this distinction, okay? It's very problematic. It's not as clear as we, uh, as the lay public can think, okay, no, it's clear when, when something is therapeutic. No, it's not. It's not clear at all. If you want to more about this later, but for now, it's enough that you know that I'm absolutely unhappy with this distinction. Hmm? So, why is this so important? Okay. Because there are uh, a group of philosophers, not only philosophers, but mainly philosophers that we call bioconservatives, that think that Treatment by whatever means or almost whatever means is fine, mm? but enhancement is morally wrong mm? and should be, as it's morally wrong, should be legally impermissible. Mm? All kind of enhancements? No. As I anticipated, only biological ones. Mm? All of them are fine with sending children to school to help them be smarter, but don't think it's equally right or right at all to give them a biological enhancement to make them an uh, enhancement. Hmm? Uh, the, well, and, and another question that maybe I should mention because the, at the beginning, when you begin studying enhancement things, you could be tempted to think that bioconservatives reject all biological techniques. I don't think this is the case. What they reject are new technology. Very few, if any, uh, bioconservative philosophers has anything to, to say about organ transplant. That's fine. And this is biological. Mm? But if the technique is new, mm, then they have a problem mm? for several reasons that we cannot elaborate more now. Mm? They come from very different groups. Don't think they, they are people on, on, on the right wing or that they are ultra religious people. Some of them are, but not all of them. Hmm? So, 
the main arguments. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to read them because I, I'm going to use the ones I need uh, later. Uh, the main arguments are these ones. First, the precautionary principle. Mm? You know, no, no, we, we cannot use a technology that is new mm? and is not, uh, we don't have the certainty that the use of this technology is not go, is, it has no risk at all of doing some harm. Mm? Uh, the value of diversity, say, no, no, it, it's fine that some children are very tall and some children are very small. This is diversity and this is something that makes the human, the human species richer and, and all the rest. Uh, then there are other ones like this. No? En enhancement is playing God. Hmm? or is going against nature, or they think that using this kind of enhancement is a kind of hubris, it's a hyper-agency. You, you, you try to be too, too self-made, hmm? like, like being, being like the gods with yourself through hyper-agency. Most of them say, no, if you want to make people better, you should only use what they call environmental uh, enhancers. So you have to change society and not to change people. So, uh, it, it, it's not very important that you, you have all this objections uh, present. What is useful is uh, to, to have a clear idea of my way or our way of classifying these objections. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, I have used uh, traffic light colors for a reason. <laughs> Some, some of the objections are about security, like the one with the precautionary principle, or are about justice. And they are green because um, these are the ones we are going to address in our experiment. And we are going to address this because we think these are the more most serious ones okay then in in red are objections that are not completely clear hmm? and they are tricky to to object to 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 address like dignity what, what exactly human dignity or what exactly human nature and then there is another one that is interesting what we call the jack factor wisdom of repugnance that according to the oxford dictionary is a feeling of horror repulsion or disgust generated by an aspect of an idea action situation and all this this is interesting and I hope we will see later why this is interesting. And it's also important to know that in general, the, the objections to, to enhancement are across the board objections. This is to say they are addressed to every type, to physical enhancers, to mood enhancers, to cognitive enhancers. So there is no, uh, maybe with the exception of health, hmm? uh, all the rest of the areas in which we would want to apply enhancement 
are subject to the same objections. Hmm? But there is something very interesting. Hmm? And the very interesting thing begins here, especially for those of you who are already, who already know enough about enhancement, is that there are some experimental studies that show clearly that moral judgment, meaning if something is morally right or wrong, depends on the type of enhancement. So there is in the general public, let's, let's say, there is no such a thing as an across the board rejection of enhancement. For example, and I, I've chosen this example because I'm going to use this for, to present our work, Cognitive enhancement is consistently considered less permissible than other enhancements. For instance, motivation enhancement. And now that we, for the first time, seeing the screen, the work, experimental studies, is the moment to try to explain to you what on earth is this of experiments. Why do we or some of us think that we should run experiment? And um, the best way of, uh, of explaining this is think first about thought experiments. If most of you are, and I think you are, uh, it's a philosophy students, you, you know that a thought experiment is one of the main tools, is the, probably the most traditional method in philosophy. Hmm? Are like kind of a small tales, narrations, history, stories, sorry, that we use to investigate the, the nature of something and they are used in in many disciplines like history mathematics but also in philosophy and in ethics and i'm going to give you three examples of ethical experiments this one let me see if i can see in the other screen because this one is have your beautiful photos there, and I prefer to read them. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This. Suppose a friend, a friend of yours, uh, or a friend of mine in this case, when in his right mind has deposited arms with me, hmm? and he asks for them when he's not in his right mind. Hmm? What I have just done is to propose you to imagine hmm, a thought experiment in, in order to help to answer the practical question. Ought I to give them back to him? This is another one. All of you know this. This is the famous trolley problem. This is a thought experiment. Imagine you are like Ned Flanders by the rails and you see a train coming at high speed that is going to hit this nice group of people here, but you can change the course of the train by pulling in a lever. Should you do it? Or should you stop the train by pushing the fat man who is standing on the bridge to stop the train for killing five others? This is a thought experiment. Last, that you also probably know, the original position. What Rawls is proposing 
it's a thought experiment. This is not the, like the, the classical contractualist thing that, no, no, look, we, we were living in the state of, na of NATO. No, we, we never live in the state of NATO. Forget about this. But please, put yourself in the shoes of someone who is meeting with other people and no one knows his place in society and all the rest. Hmm? It's another thought experiment. So what are they used thought is, uh, for? Thought experiments, okay. To illustrate some complex philosophical concept and this way help answering a philosophical questions or, or specifically ethical in, uh, in our case. For instance, the examples I just skipped given you try to help you to answer the question, what is justice? Hmm? And what or what is the right thing to do? So, why we philosophers think that thought experiments are useful to, to, to are useful and can help uh, answer philosophical questions? This is interesting. Okay because they appeal to our intuitions. Hmm? So, ideally, when everything goes well, everybody agree on the same answer. The philosopher and the lay people, they agree. Yes, this is the right thing to do. Or, yes, these are the principles of justice that has to be chosen. And this agreement, uh, this intuitions agreement, is taken by philosophers as evidence for or against some philosophical thesis. Hmm? That's why we use thought experiments. For example, again, look at the, at the thought experiment that is the oldest one of <clears throat> the friend's arm. And imagine everything goes well. <clears throat> And the philosopher is spoken here. No one would say that I ought or that I should be right in doing so, in giving back the arms to my friend who is the rightful owner when he is not in his right mind. Any more than they would say I ought always to speak the truth to one who is in this condition meaning out of his right mind. And the, the audience replied, you are quite right. But then said the philosopher, speaking the truth and paying your debt is not a correct definition of justice. And then the audience said, quite correct, Socrates. This is the ideal situation. I used to, to disentangle a complex concept like justice. I use a thought experiment. And if everybody agrees, that's fantastic. This is taken as evidence that our idea or our definition of justice is, is the one that we should be used. Okay, so. And that's why for, for many philosophers, <clears throat> these thought experiments that we can do in class or when, while sitting in, a, in an armchair, it's enough. Hmm? It's the, the proper tool of philosophy. Hmm? It's the, the tool that, that gives us a, some kind of evidence and for other people the only possible evidence 
to support some philosophical thesis. So an empirical investigation is a waste of time and money. But uh, things are not always so nice as in the Socratic dialogues that if you have read them, please remember that all of them at the end of the day, almost all of them end with people saying, you are right, Socrates, we agree with you. Hmm? But what if this is not what happens? What if people, I mean the audience, people uh, working in the Agora uh, and listening to Socrates disagree with him? Or some disagree and others agree? And what is, because you can say, okay, but they are not trained. They are, as you say, lay people. Hmm? Philosophers are the ones trained in the use of thought experiments. So at the end of the day, if the people don't agree with Socrates, so bad for the people. Okay, it's Socrates who is uh, on the right. But what if philosophers disagree? What if not all of them agree? after a thought experiment. Who is right? Hmm? So for this reason, many, many philosophers have criticized uh, this appeal to intuitions as the last resort. And some others uh, have begun designing experiments to know, to begin with, if people, lay people, not only lay people, but mainly lay people, share the, the philosopher's intuitions. And this is experimental philosophy. And in, in our case, experimental uh, ethics. Mm? We do this because we don't want to assume that the philosopher's intuitions are shared by the rest of the people. We don't know. This is something that we have to find out. And um, apart from this, because we think, or many of us think, that uh, this kind of intuitions cannot be taken at first value, even when said by everybody. Hmm? Because maybe we should try to find out why people have the intuitions they have. So, this is my theme. Uh, this is why some philosophers like me and, and then uh, are going into experimental philosophy and experimental ethics. I, this is the two very intelligent, smart and, and handsome philosophers with whom I, I work, Emilian. Mikhailo from the University of Bucharest, who is over there somewhere, and Ivar Hanikainen. So we three, uh, some time ago, began thinking about designing an experiment on cognitive enhancement. Hmm? Why? Okay, because as I said before, there are some studies showing that the objections, people's objections, are different depending on the type. For instance, cognitive enhancement is one of the most objected to. But we think that it also depends on the context of use meaning the kinds of situations where people use a cognitive enhancement. We focus in, on cognitive enhancement and no other type of enhancement precisely because we know that this is the, the one considered less permissible. 
these are like uh, technical things that if you want you can ask in the q and a session but what we have done is design four four vignettes uh, portraying four different contexts of use. I'm going to show you the four of them and you will see that are exactly like thought experiments. The only difference is that in our case it's a real experiment. Okay, we really go to people and ask these questions. This is the first of them. Let me look for it here. What we call the workplace performance as scenario. I'm going to read only this one because it's a bit late. John, that John is the, the main character of our, of our story, is a public accountant. His concentration capacity is in the normal range for his profession. While preparing a continued report, he takes smart pills in order to improve his concentration and focus. These pills do not have serious effects. You can see that there are some words highlighted in colors. This is for you to see, look at the ones in, in blue, normal range for his profession. This is the way to stress that we are in the field, in the field of enhancement and not therapy. It's not that John has some kind of uh, attention deficit. No, 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 no. He's, he's normal absolutely normal he's like the rest of the contents so what what he wants to do is not to to try some therapy to reach a normal level but to enhance and then in green you have the words that we put to neutralize risk because uh we think that yes uh concerns about the security of enhancements are quite correct mm? so we want the the people to think that we are using a, a, a kind of enhancer a, a small pill that have no serious size effect no more that a paracetamol okay so we wrote four uh, scenarios like this one this is the first one then we have the artistic one that is exactly the same. The only difference is that John, our main character, is a music composer. Then we have another regarding education in which, in which John is an undergraduate student. And then you have a sport one in which John is a chess player. What we did was to, we saw each of these uh, small vignettes and after each of them, we asked the people this question, one only question, indicate whether you agree or disagree with the following statement on a scale from one to seven, one strongly disagree, Seven strongly agree. I find John's behavior morally acceptable. As you can say, what we the, the aim of, of this experiment is to know if people share the rejections, the philosopher or some philosopher's rejection of biological enhancements. This is a, a kind of biological enhancement across the board, hmm? irrespective of the context of use. And then for, for reasons I can elaborate, elaborate later if you want, after people answer these questions about their four scenarios, we made a check on legal beliefs. So I'm going to read, sometimes people take smart pills to make them perform better than they would otherwise do. 
uh, do you believe it already exists regulation which legally forbids taking this type of pill to do your job or make art or study or do the sport so this was the the experiment results they are here hmm? maybe the let me show you maybe this is clearer than the previous one mm -hmm. what happens well a couple of things happen to begin with that uh lay people don't seem to agree a lot with bioconservatives they in general don't find absolutely morally impermissible to use smart pills but then you can see that they don't rate the four scenarios in the same way concretely um, less than half of our subjects rated all the four scenarios in the same way hmm? This is to say, for the majority of them, uh, the moral evaluation of the four contexts in which people are using smart pills deserve a distinctive and unique moral assessment. And of these people who are confirming our hypothesis say yes you cannot say across the board that all of them are equally right or equally wrong there are differences depending on the context of all of them all of them absolutely all of them found the sport scenario the chess player less morally permissible hmm? why hmm? well uh, the the first explanation that comes to your mind is that when we think about expo sports we think about competition people compete in sports playing football playing chess uh, basketball or swimming mm? usually sports is a competitive activity and in competitive activities is where uh, concerns about justice arise more easily mm? and remember justice is one of the main objections against enhancement and the one we care more about mm? and especially in sports when we think about uh uh, an enhancement, usually not a cognitive enhancement, but EPO or whatever, one expression comes to our minds. This is cheating. The cyclist who is injecting himself, EPO, he's cheating on the other people. He's gaining an unjust advantage over the others. So this is probably the the reason why people think that it's morally worst to use uh enhancers in sports and in fact this is why we did the the legal beliefs checks because as you know there are strong relations between legal and moral beliefs um, um, going both ways many people think that something is moral certainly it, it it has to be illegal and if it's not they say ah, but is this legal because this is completely immoral and the other way around when people believe that something is illegal this strongly suggests to them that this is something morally wrong with this activity and as you see in our legal beliefs check let me go to the comments 
only in the case of a sport, the majority of people think that there is a specific real existing regulation for giving, taking small pills, as there are in about EPO. Hmm? So, what this is just, uh, well, let me tell you what we, did, what we did next. And I'm going to stop here because this is been a quite long presentation. Uh, this was the first experiment we, we ran like a year ago or, or maybe more, probably a million remember better than me. So our next step was to say, okay, we have all the reasons to think that this difference between the sport scenario and the other three has some connection with justice. Hmm? And justice is a very complex term. The, yeah, remember, the, the first thought experiment was by Socrates and was about justice. And we are still <laughs> doing thought experiments because it's not clear at all what very different components the idea of justice may have. Mm? And to begin with, and, and to confirm, and this is the only thing that I'm going to say, to confirm that the, the explanation of the differential treatment of the sport scenario was due to competition, the next step was to write two versions of each scenario, one competitive and one non-competitive. Just to show you the most problematic in a sports, hmm? let me, uh, where it is? In the sports, we, we have a competitive version that say Alex, now our main character is named Alex, decides to sign up for a national chess tournament, knowing that his long-time rivals will be there. On the day of the tournament, he takes smart pills to improve his concentration during the chess game. As you say, we have a stress and underline a lot the competitive character because it's what we want to know. And then there is a, a non-competitive person in which Alex is playing chess with a computer program. Okay, so there is nothing, he's not competing with other human beings, he's not gaining any advantages in front of the other. And then just as another example, in the artistic performance scenario, we have a competitive version in which Steve, that is a musician, is going to participate in an audition. Hmm? So he takes smart, smart pills to concentrate better and to get into the orchestra instead of other people. So he's clearly com competing. And in the non-competitive version, Steve just wants to concentrate in his music playing because it's his, uh, I don't know, nephew. It's his nephew birthday and he wants to, to write a very nice song to make his nephew feel special. Hmm? Uh, as just, uh, this is all, as you say, I, I, I realize I don't have the, the time to, to show you all the second experiments, experiment, but let me you anticipate, yes, we were right. Hmm? Usually people, rate the competitive scenarios as being uh, morally more problematic than when the, the scenario is not competitive. And, and that's all. Thank you and your questions and comments will be very welcome. Thank you for your patience.